Hi, folks. Well, look, do you know every morning, you probably know that I go down the beach every day and I just go for a wander down there. And it's really to get a bit exercise in. But what happens down there? I do meet the odd person. And I've met this very, very interesting guy. And I've known him now for oh, a number of years. We've seen each other down the beach walking around. I used to see him getting the bus in the mornings, walking across the golf course. Uh, and we struck up some conversations, but this guy is absolutely fascinating. He's one of these people that you would not assume to know too much about anything. But once you start talking to him, crikey, he is an AUT lecturer. He's retired now and an historian. So we started talking yesterday about politics and he was unable to tell me the history of where politics actually originated from. And then when we were drawing some analogies to that, so let me just welcome aboard. So Peter Gillendale, so welcome aboard, and uh, really great to see you. And well, out of the beach environment, and <laughs> here on the here on my little show. Yeah, nice to be with you, Max. Well, look, Peter, let, can we just sort of carry our conversation yeah. on from yesterday? I know we haven't sure. got the breaking waves behind us, but at least we can have a <laughs> chat. But yeah. um, um, yesterday I was moaning about the government and possibly, you know, the difficulties we're having in politics with, in relation to COVID as well. Mm, yeah. And you you went on and said um, something about, was it the Roman Empire and, uh, um, and, and how it was all the birth of politics sort of thing? I think I, think I, I, think I was talking about ancient Greece and uh, how, you know, as a historian, you kind of, uh, you're doomed to see um, see things repeat themselves if people don't actually understand what they're doing. Um, and uh, so I was talking a little bit about how a democracy came out of ancient Greece um, and how, uh, you know, while we can mythologize this, actually Greece had all of the things that could go wrong in politics as well. So, you know, uh, in, in ancient Greece, you have tyranny, you know, uh, people who take over and, and, and uh, get rid of democracy and and simply rule on their own. Um, that sounds and, familiar, Peter, because that's what yep. a lot of people are accusing this current government of doing. <laughs> but we are in crisis mode, yeah. and uh, and as you your 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 worldly yeah. experience tells yeah. you, that's not unusual. We've been there no. before. No, it's a, the the uh, there's a difference between a permanent tyranny and uh, and a sort of crisis. So, um, uh, government government will take the power it, it needs to in a in a crisis. But uh, your your problem is when it won't give it back um, once the crisis is over, and that's 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 what you've got to watch out for. Um, then uh, you you have. Um, uh, another th uh, thing which was quite common in ancient Greece, which was power by the best people, um, uh, that's called oligarchy. And so uh, the, uh, quite frequently when in a class system, for example, uh, the people of one class will decide that they uh, they have the monopoly on on good sense and power and uh, uh, and so that they they should rule and keep all those unruly other people down. Well, you know, um, but because I remember was saying to you yesterday, I hope you don't mind me interrupting you all the time. Yeah, but, yeah um, that's fine. Yesterday, um, I, I said, well, look at Churchill, you know, during yeah. a crisis, and we are mm -hmm. in crisis now, we're in wartime. Mm -hmm. um, Churchill was at, at, at war, and he proved to be an excellent uh, military, uh, well, wartime leader. Yeah. And yet, as soon as, soon as the wartime was over, they threw him out with anger, and he was mm -hmm. uh, virtually a nobody, which was pretty harsh. Yeah. But, but yeah. is, is, is that sort of concept not unusual? But I heard uh, you say something there that really got belonging. They give it back. Now I heard yeah. that as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, with Churchill, um, uh, my my uh, grandfather um, apparently uh, told my mother, you know, when when Churchill was put in, he said, he, he said, "Well, Churchill's a scoundrel, but he'll get the job done." <laughs> and, well, that's and, exactly uh, true, wasn't it? Yeah, and uh, and so the 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 British public sort of said, "Thank you very much." Churchill, but after the war, uh, we don't need that brand of politics. We need something else to rebuild, um, and that's that's kind of. Uh, I think you put that well, very politely, yeah. but um, <laughs> currently, right now, a lot of people are very concerned with the style of politics we're seeing in New Zealand. Mm. And look, one thing that resonates with me, I'm quite critical as well. But yeah. um, during crisis, you do need some pretty firm hand, and you do yeah. need to be um, 
ruled and uh, to some to some quite some degree, and that's really been pushed back by a lot of New Zealanders. Yes, well, I th I think that that's um, uh, it's it's a quite a complex thing to to really understand why why that's happening, but it does come down to ideology, and um, we we tend, uh, you know, a lot of people in New Zealand follow a liberal ideology. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, the United States co Constitution was created by people in, in the throes of 18th century liberalism and the the basis of of this around freedom of choice and uh uh liberty and uh, and these these things resonate for for a lot of us and it comes through uh american popular culture and all of all of those uh things so um the idea that we have a right to uh you know to to make our own decisions and to be free to do what we want uh has a lot of appeal um i guess i i'm interested in in the balance that there is between rights and responsibility you know um and and the covid situation is one where you know uh, this brings that that contrast into you know you get some people who say we have a responsibility to make sure that everyone is protected and other people who say i don't want my rights to be infringed by the government well and, look they're taking that concept then and what i was fascinated with yesterday was i had no idea i mean i i actually think we're in a very unique situation here and, and obviously yeah, no one's yeah. dealt with um, viruses a wartime bloody concept yeah. but go back to your greek days yeah those i mean the prior to well some sort of democracy i'll call it yeah. that and you please correct me because i really yeah. am a bit vague on this yeah there would have been um slave labor there would have been slaves yeah. there would have been the master mm. and the and the mm. kingdom and of course the peasants and the making the fields and those sort of things who were controlled quite a lot were yeah. they or weren't they and then they were introduced into this idea of democracy is that is that how i see it is it, uh, it, it fu fundamentally i mean uh, the systems were were you, you know places were smaller back then um and the systems tended to be you know um based around either tribe tribes uh you know tribal um setups or um, monarchies of some form or other um, and then the Greeks introduced this idea of democracy, which was, uh, you know, that people should collectively, um, you know, decide on things together. Uh, that has to be put into context. If you if you were in Athens, for example, and you uh, might have had forty or fifty thousand people living there, uh, only six or seven thousand of them actually voted because they were the land owning ones. Oh, uh, is that right? Yes. People people who were citizens of other other um, towns or who were slaves or who were women um, were not part of uh, of the group that democracy um, uh, f filled in. So so you have you have to say democracy in ancient Greece wasn't quite the thing that we we have today. <laughs> it sounded um, good in concept, but yeah, it, uh, yeah. it's, it's a small minority of the elite. I and, guess. and 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 what what you have in democracy is is people trying to convince other people of the right way to move forward and so it was very much based in in a public debate um but of course in that situation you are um caught up with with uh, how who is the best speaker uh, so the the science of rhetoric was was created by the ancient greeks so the better that you could speak your idea the more likely pe people were to believe you and so things like uh, for example you know if you have a big idea you have a dramatic pause, right? That's so political that's spin, rhetoric. as we call it today, was actually gave, gave birth immediately when we got into some sort of democracy. Yes, yeah, basically. Uh, it, otherwise, what you what you have in a in a a more hierarchical system is you have lobbying uh, and courtiers trying to convince a monarch or, or whatever of uh, of the way to move forward. So it's a different different way of people trying to get their ideas across. But of course, in those days, I guess what, what was um, the 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 benefit of belonging to a uh, well, I don't know what they call yeah. it, an empire or whatever, was protection. So protection, because yes, yes. I guess in those days there was yeah. a lot of violence and and um, takeovers yeah. and, and and raids yeah. occurring. 
But yes. whereas today, um, I'm, I'm not sure what we actually try, what benefits we get from our government. I can only see negatives. But 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 um, but it's it's interesting to see the concept of where the actual different types of and actually you, you're mentioning it just now, um, the spin and the leadership. So maybe talk us through a bit of that. That what happened in the old days with um, different types of leadership styles. Well, uh, within a, within a democracy, uh, it, you know, you uh, you could, for example, end up with somebody who was a demagogue. Uh, so Athens had a couple of those, uh, where people who were sufficiently charismatic were able to carry the people with them and in effect become an elected dictator um, and uh, you will have heard um, the the word demagogue probably thrown around in relation to Donald Trump uh, that uh, you know that was that was a, a criticism of his approach because he he, he very much uh, is able to whip people up um, into and and typically of this it's about trying to create a sense of we are the core people and everybody else is other and uh -huh. uh, right and uh, and so you will find that that uh, people who who are working in that mode will will create an enemy uh, that they they need to fight uh, fight against. So you've got uh, those those systems you have, and I, I should say I'm not a political historian. So uh, you know, uh, well, you're doing take, a good job, Peter. Because I'm I mean, doing, you're doing the best I me. can on this. But uh, um, so you've got you've got that. You tend to have have monarchies being the primary um, approach through much of history, uh, and then uh, you began to get uh, parliamentary de democracy starting in Britain in the 1600s and uh, uh, moving forward from, from there. But, um, you know, obviously you, you also, when you're looking back at, at the ancient world, um, religion and politics were not divided. That's something that's happened more recently. The idea of the state and the church being separate entities is, is but just going back thing. to the demigod thing, yeah. because um, we've yeah. got a, a very charismatic leader here and she took yeah. over uh, and just astonished the country with so much support, whereupon mm. she has ultimate power now, ultimate. Yeah. And we've never seen power flexed so much and so, with so much, I would say brutality, but so, you know, so much vigor. And um, with a smile on our face, which is a different style. Mm. Now, you've got the, what you've got, what I haven't got, and maybe a lot of the viewers haven't got, is a knowledge of history. And yeah. what that, that Jacinda's style of leadership right now, um, it's quite charismatic. But again, yeah. I, I feel the tides turning. Now, that must have happened in history. What, what generally happens to these demigods? Well, as I say, I, I mean, I don't agree with you, Max, that Jacinda is behaving like a demagogue. But anyway, um, I, I, it, but I can see the the there are some resemblances. Um, uh, demagogues, generally speaking, um, you know, will uh, run run a certain course, and then they will be torn down. Uh, what I would say in this case is that. Um, uh, that once COVID is over, things will return to normal. Uh, you know, uh, come come the middle of next year, uh, politics will have returned back to its pre-COVID uh, period. I would hope that's the case. I, I wouldn't want to see uh, a, a more um, full-on flexing of this type of, of power happen um, for a long period of time, but in a you crisis, know, you know, uh, the other thing uh, is interesting yeah. because my simple knowledge of, of some of the history, which you've got vast, yeah. is that a lot of um, charismatic leaders were also taken out. I mean, assassinated. Mm. Now, what we've seen of recent times, and John Key was a good example. Yeah. He resigned right when he was at the peak, knowing, I think, that mm. possibly if he'd stayed in there, he would have sunk because we only see yeah. them do two to three terms and then they're not loved as yeah. much. Yeah. The rumor is right now that our current leader, our prime minister, is talking now of actually resigning next year. And that's why the, the Labour Party is getting together in a conference this weekend. Now, that's a rumor and what may not be true. But is this a similarity to the past where actually rather than them resigning, they get actually assassinated? No, a true, a true demagogue uh, will never let go of power. Right, um, <laughs> you, you know, once 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 they they have power, they will tend to gravitate to, to dictatorship. Um, 
uh, and as I say, that's where I think the the difference lies here. I don't think that this is a is a, a power that necessarily uh, is being exerted because for the sake of power. I think it's being exerted because you know the the leadership think it's the you know that there has to be a path, and this is the path that will give us the least number of deaths, which it has. See, a lot of us are, are, are trying to speculate what's going to happen in the future. And you're yeah. the window to that because you've seen previous yeah. examples. Yeah. And um, what 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 the thoughts yeah. are is how will this end? Now, I mean, I do agree with you. I don't know what a demon god is. And so mm -hmm. that definition, you're probably yeah. right. Is I have not been correct with it. But how would possibly this particular government's power base actually end? Because they've got almighty. Now, we've seen Winston Peters do it. There's some very mm -hmm. vast... Um, there's been some very weird sort of power bases in New Zealand, but yes. the politics right now are fascinating. Yes, uh, well, I, I agree. I mean, I think that the the uh, political system currently is 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 at crisis point, uh, but the crisis I see it is um, is that we're um, getting further and further apart. And I think that the the major thing that you have to have in a democracy is a sense of of respect for the institutions of a democracy, and uh, a, a respect for opinions that are different. And what worries me, you know, from a historical perspective at the moment, is that I'm seeing a greater and greater um, a split between people on both sides in terms of the rhetoric and the the lack of willingness to listen to anything other than the chat room that the internet is giving um and so people are are on both sides i think getting further and further apart and that is never a good thing for a democracy and, and has that happened in the past yes is it, 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 it it, it's it's a constant tension. Uh, I mean, actually trying to keep a democracy together is a very difficult thing because it requires a lot of people to put invest time into understanding the views of people that they don't agree with, and that is that is a, a, a difficult thing. And you tend to end as a result end up with uh, systems which are, you know probably elected dictatorships more than anything else where there's a nod to democracy but actually that's not what you have um and you probably have that a lot more than you have a true democracy i, I would say i lived in scandinavia for uh, you know in denmark for four years mm. and um the style of politics that I saw there in the 80s was a very different beast. It, it actually, you, on television, you would get people from all parties sitting down, talking about an issue in a constructive way. And unfortunately, our, our system coming from the Westminster adversarial one creates division. And personally, I, you know, I, I, I think if a functioning democracy really needs people to to listen to, you know, why is the other side doing what what it's doing? Don't have to agree with it, but you need to respect the other views. Oh, I totally agree. But, you yeah. know, the other thing I, I do find is a phenomenon chatting to people now and I get terrified yeah. Um, yeah. because they might be on the other poles of, of views. Yeah. But what I'm what I find with people, they think they know the opposition well, and they have yeah. a good balance of, of thinking across the whole vast yeah. areas. Yeah. And in my view, they haven't really considered a lot about their opposing view. No. And that does worry me, but it's no. they concept in their minds, they think they have got a good balanced view, and they're really saying the other side's completely wrong, and this yes. is where I think it's right. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I don't have any problem with people coming to a strong uh, view about things but it's it's how you treat the other side is the is the important thing and i i see on both sides of the political spectrum at the moment a lot of uh, you know contempt and outrage happening for you know relative to uh, other viewpoints and i don't think that that is a healthy thing for our democracy do you, do you think that's because of the, our our internet system and the fact that the yeah. mainstream media is slowly dying and we're now relying more and more upon the the gossip machine which is you know social media 
Now, is that changing the whole dimensions of our of our society and the way we think? Because we've got yeah. so many thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of sources of information yeah. that we're actually not listening to the same thing at all. None of us are. No, and and really, we're at the mercy of the algorithms. So that you know, what what happens is that people on both sides of the thing only ever get fed stuff that they basically agree with, and so as a result, uh, they they feel that all right thinking normal people agree with them and that anyone who doesn't, uh, you know, must be some kind of crazy uh, you know, person who's beyond contempt. Um, and uh, as I say, that's that I would, uh, you know, there's, there's a kind of moral dimension to that. If you want somebody to follow up on, on all of this, I I'd strongly recommend reading a guy called, you know, you can get it off this Wikipedia page, but a guy called Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, who's looked at how the, you know the the moral bases of of people's thinking um and he's found that there's a there's a fundamental difference in the moral priorities of liberals and conservatives uh it's a very interesting thing i i know you don't want to go into too much detail here so i won't i won't i won't run you through all of that oh, but, but Peter, it does um, explain I, I mean, now, my trips to the beach i used to i, I look forward to you yeah. talking to you it was over a year ago yeah. i bumped into you and of course i don't know a lot of the viewers might know i'm i consider myself an employment law expert yeah. There's something that I'd never thought of before when I bumped into you. And I, well, what, what would Peter know? He's an historian. He wouldn't understand employment issues and, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. But wow, you just threw me because what you gave me a concept I hadn't thought about was how did it come about? And the, and the concept was people having the right to sell their labor. Yes. And that, that, that yeah. just threw me. Can you take us back, back to that sort of concept? Yeah. Okay. Um, this this is uh you know the 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 fundamental really of of um uh, you know the way that we we think about law is is uh, going back to and it's a guy called john locke um who uh, was a philosopher and he he um uh, came up with this notion that everybody had had the right to uh, to their own property and part of uh, of uh, that property was their labor and uh, and so uh, he uh, you know prior to that people tended to be indentured laborers they tended to live you know on the land and uh, and they their responsibility was to the landowner um, after that people were and you know through the industrial revolution they were able to move around and sell their labor ideally of course you know it didn't didn't work out entirely to their favor uh, through the industrial revolution but um uh, you know and but you know something you've just said to me which i didn't realize that either that um john locke yeah. i thought his, his principles you could sell labor but what you've just told me yeah. now yeah. actually it really resonates too because yeah. the facts are that it wasn't just labor he had no. land was yeah. it, how did they how did they mix it did you get a bit of land if you had a job is that what you got well, no, uh, but but the the ideal was that people should be able to move around. They should be able to sell their labour, and they should be able to become land owning, um, rather than uh, being, uh, you know, all, all working, uh, you, you know, on common land uh, that was intended to um, uh, to to be, uh, you know, owned by by the local landowner and you were working for that person. So it was, uh, you know, this is one of the key things again of of the move towards a liberal approach to thinking imagine, about imagine things. Imagine John Locke now, because I'm taking this as centuries ago that John yeah. Locke came up with this 16, concept. 1600s, yes. Oh, yeah. I imagine if he rushed forward now, he'd be going so proudly saying, look at what my employment's done, you know, that's look at all that. And I've really created that concept mm -hmm. and the whole of institutional, the whole of society is based on me. But he'd be now scratching his head about the uh, land ownership, looking at what and people's uh, ability to buy land in New Zealand. That's the thing is disappearing quickly. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm not going to. I, I really don't know enough about uh, about the whole um, property market and so on to to be able to fill you in on that. But uh, but Locke Locke was interesting, and uh, I, I came into all of this because I was sort of looking at the history of copyright, which is again uh, a 
tied up in all of this. So, you know, the idea that if you, if you uh, put work into something, you have a right to benefit from it for a certain amount of time. And in the early days, that, that uh, he, I think Locke suggested that copyright should last for 15 years. Uh, it's gradually got extended and extended and extended. <laughs> and look at you, my dear friend, because um, you don't sell your labour. You sell your mind. So mm. what you've been able to do over the years, I mean, you're an educationer. So yeah. you've been able to sell your knowledge and, and part that and, um, you know, get benefit from it from a personal basis. So it goes further, doesn't it, to just physical. We, we think of labor as yeah. physical work. And now it's becoming um, intellectual capital. And that's where um, I think that's I find that fascinating. And well, the, the, how the far does it go? Yeah, well, the move to inter intellectual capital has been is absolutely tied up with the the patent and copyright law because uh, you know with with the length of time that you now have rights to an idea, uh, it almost you know doesn't pay to labour. So hence our culture has has moved all all the labour offshore and just concentrated on the intellectual uh, property. That's, That's interesting in itself because where yeah. does it start and stop? Because, I mean, we used to talk about the housewives at home. Their yeah. actual work and effort was never rewarded enough no, uh, or, or not. paid enough or recognised as some efforts, whereas yeah. today we're getting more and more into that. And, um, well, look at yourself. I mean, um, you're um, able to sell what ideas and put it in, in, into concept, but other people have ideas and think they're valued. Yeah. And uh, it's the marketplace. Will they buy it? Well, I'd have to I'd have to say being 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 an academic and educationalist, I wouldn't say that people put a very high price on this. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm stealing it now for free. I'm not paying Peter for this interview, so I'm doing rather well out of this. All right, Peter, should we wind it up there? But look, um, have you got any sort of final words or summaries you'd like to sort of share with us? Um, no, I mean, I I think. Uh, uh, I think the, the the major thing is to uh, that where I I think the most interesting part of history is actually in the 18th century. Um, I think that if you really want to understand where where modern thinking happens, uh, it it is in that period. You know, it's a period of the American Revolution. It's where liberal thinking came. And I uh, if if you want one final little uh, thought, I I would. Um, say that for me, you know, and I, I, I would regard myself as a, a, a sort of a liberal in the classic sense of it, but I do think that liberalism uh, has a silent partner, which is um, the Christian ethic of, of um, loving your neighbour. And uh, as liberalism has moved outwards uh, and has moved away from from a link with Christianity. I think you see a much greater risk of of selfishness coming into this. And so, uh, if the, if there's something that I would I, I would uh, caution liberals to think about, it is it is the that sense. And this is why I think you and I uh, find that we can talk together is because yeah. I think that you are a uh, uh, very uh, you know, much engaged in thinking about you, your responsibility to your community and so on. And I well, think- Well, you know what you've just done, my good friend? <laughs> you've actually set it up for the next episode, the next exciting episode of Peter Gilder's um, theories on, on our existence. And look, I think that's fantastic because yeah. do I agree with you? Yes, I think selfishness and polarization, I call it as, and also <laughs> cocooning people staying at it. This. Let's hold that thought until yeah. next time we come together and uh, you're coming yeah. back. I don't think you've got a choice, by the way. I'll be knocking on your door. <laughs> oh, look, God. Surely I, I should have freedom of choice, Max. <laughs> no, 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 none at all. None at all. But certainly fascinating, Peter, and I think yeah. that's been well worth it. And I hope uh, other people out there, if you've enjoyed this, leave your comments. But uh, um, Peter and I will do a set. We'll do another one because yeah. the, 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 I've thoroughly enjoyed today. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Thanks, Max.